I'd like to read something to you before I pray. This is from Isaiah 46. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all of the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times and what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted, you who are now far from righteousness. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away. And my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. And that is a, one of many prophecies regarding Israel in the end times. Uh, we uh, all are right to be concerned, even to be disgusted with what we've seen go on in, uh, in Israel. And it's, it's okay to have those feelings. But one thing I don't want you to believe is that there's, Israel is in any danger of being uh, defeated by any enemies. The, the prophecies were that when God brought his people back, they would remain forever. And they're back, they're staying there. All you have to do is look at their history to know that God is with them, and he's with them now, and he has a plan for them. And we just want to pray that all those people in the midst of this will find this salvation that, they, that God has for them if they will just turn to him. I actually had a request to... Pray the same prayer I prayed last week. And I said, sure. So if you'll join me. Father, we pray today for the people of Israel and the peace of Israel. We add our prayers to the millions of other believers praying this, for this peace. We pray for the safe release of the hostages and for comfort to the families of those who died. We know that Satan is the prince of this dark world and this evil age, but you, O oh Lord, are the king of the universe. So we lift up this prayer with confidence to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, thank you for being here. I'd like to think I have a good message prepared for this week. But honestly, it won't mean much if we don't remember what last week's message was about. It was about the gospel message. And I know how my memory is. I'm sure most of you don't remember much of what was said last week. That's okay. And many of you weren't here last week. But I would like to review. <clears throat> uh, so there's a written review inside the bulletin. When I'm finished... If there's anything I failed to make clear about the gospel, that's God's good news for us, please say something. I, I would take the time during the service 
to try and clear up anything that I wasn't clear about. So let's look at this review. Our, journey, our earthly journey as a follower of Jesus begins when we are justified and made right with God. And it ends when we are glorified and made perfect in God. What comes in between is a process called sanctification. Sanctification is about our journey through this life with God, and it is what most of the New Testament is about. Can we know how we are doing on our journey? Jesus wrote to seven churches in Asia. He told them what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong, which always had to do with the response to the gospel, God's good news. Then Jesus says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is saying to examine ourselves when we read about those churches. The apostle Paul wrote letters to seven churches also, and they can be used for the same purpose, to examine what we believe and in whom we trust. One of Paul's letters was to the Galatians, and they were making the biggest mistake of all. They heard the true gospel, but were led astray by false teachers and a false gospel. That somehow they thought they needed to earn their salvation or work to keep it. That is not what the Bible says the gospel message is. The gospel is all about what God has done for us, nothing about what we can do to improve our standing with him or what actions will affect his love for us. Just believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and then rose from the dead in a resurrected body, which is also your hope. A beautiful gospel message. It's all about what God has done to save us, nothing about what we could ever do or have ever done to save ourselves. But we must know that message so well we can spot the frauds, the false teachings. So, honestly, does anybody have any question or need any clarification about what the Bible says about the gospel message? That's great. And I'm not surprised. So, last week, we saw Paul's unhappy letter, which was written because the Galatians had fallen for a false gospel, which is about the most destructive thing that can happen to a church, and one of Satan's best lies to divide us and to confuse the true gospel. This week, I want to show you Paul's happy letter, his letter to the Philippians, don't make too much about those labels. I made those up. But all of Paul's letters have been studied for 2,000 years. And they each have unique traits and a special purpose which help us to remember one from another. For example, you could probably call both 1st and 2nd Corinthians unhappy letters. Paul was certainly frustrated when he wrote them because they just kept squabbling over things important and over things unimportant. In 2 Corinthians, he was so frustrated, he practically said, don't make me write 3 Corinthians. There are also two letters to the Thessalonians. Why? Because they kept writing Paul with questions. And because of their questions, we have information about Christ and his return that isn't found anywhere else. Romans was Paul's magnum opus. It was written in about 57 AD after Paul had been preaching for 20 years. This was his only letter to a church that he hadn't started and he had never visited. It's also the most complete letter covering all the critical topics, including the gospel, 
Jews and Gentiles, sound doctrine, and warnings about false teachers. Ephesians could be called another happy letter. Paul spent more time in Ephesus during his three journeys than any other city. He had a lot of friends there, and they were staying true to the gospel. In this letter, Paul gives some of the most practical guidance for Christian living that can be found in the Bible. Finally, the Colossians. This was a church making the same mistake we see churches making today. That is, incorporating their culture into the gospel. It must always be gospel truth before cultural norms. And if they don't agree, the gospel always wins. And let me say thank you again for standing on that biblical truth and not giving in to this disintegrating culture we live in. And don't forget that the letters to the Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were all written while Paul was chained to a Roman guard and under house arrest in Rome, waiting to see if Nero was going to let him go or have him executed. Paul's circumstances never interfered with his mission of spreading the gospel and encouraging believers. I'm going to read several passages from this happiest of Paul's letters. But the best way to appreciate this encouraging letter is to read the whole thing yourself. It's only four chapters. You could read it in 20 minutes. Here are the opening verses to, to Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Jesus who are at Philippi and with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In verse 4, Paul mentions his joy with the Philippians. In just four chapters, he mentions joy or joyful or joyous 16 times. So who were these Christians that brought Paul so much joy? On his second missionary trip, after revisiting the churches in Galatia, Paul wanted to go to Ephesus. But the Spirit compelled him to leave Asia and cross over to Europe for the first time. The city of Philippi was his first stop, and his first European convert was a woman named Lydia. Just one of many times God used a woman to further his kingdom work at a critical time. Philippi was a Roman colony and a favorite retirement spot for Roman soldiers. Ninety years earlier, Philippi, which is named after Philip of Macedonia, Alexander the Great's father, Philippi was the location of the final and decisive battle between Mark Anthony's legions and the forces of Julius Caesar, ending the Roman Civil War. The Jewish community there was probably smaller than Paul was used to seeing. After preaching the gospel to a crowd of Gentiles, Paul managed to anger a Gentile businessman when he healed a demon-possessed slave girl who earned money for him by telling fortunes. This got Paul and Silas thrown in jail. That night, while they were singing and praising God, an unusual earthquake struck, not destroying anything, just shaking open the prison doors and causing everyone's chains to fall off. Instead of escaping, Paul and Silas told the jailer they were still there and then preached the gospel to him. And he believed and invited Paul to preach that message to his family. That night, Paul went to the jailer's house, preached the gospel, and they all believed and were baptized. It was probably for this reason that the Philippian church sent a man named Epaphroditus with a message of concern to Paul when, he heard, when they had all heard that he was in jail in Rome. Why wasn't 
God setting him free again? Was it possible God was, Paul was out of God's will or not trusting him as before? Paul assures them with the, these words, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And then he further reassures them with these famous words, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. But my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary. Paul wasn't going to waste this opportunity by just responding to their concerns for him. Instead, he wrote this beautiful letter full of teaching and encouragement to this faithful and generous church that was one of Paul's greatest successes. He wanted to exhort them to even greater faith and kingdom works. The one thing every believer can work harder at is loving one another because we aren't all real lovable. But Paul told the Philippians this, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ to the glory and praise of God. Wise and discerning love for one another brings glory and praise to God, and there is no limit to how much we can love one another. In chapter 2, Paul teaches a lesson every church needs to know. It's the, it's the message of unity, being in agreement in our love and support of, of God and, and those around us, because we're all on the same journey. Satan's ploy is always to divide believers with petty disagreements and untrue words. This is how Paul said it. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, one with another, of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count yourselves others, count others more significant than yourselves. Okay, uh, maybe now you understand why I titled this, We Can All Do Better. We can all care more. We can all be more kind, and we can all love one another better. That is is what pleases God. Paul further exhorts him saying, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Stop arguing and complaining. That's something we can all do better at. But this all sounds like we have a lot of work to do as believers. You probably remember a few minutes ago, I said the gospel is all about what God has done for us, and there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. It's just in our nature to assume that there's a quid pro quo, there is no free lunch, God does his part, we do our part, and that's how it works. But our salvation is a gift. We can't do anything to earn it. We just agree with God. We need saving, and Jesus is that Savior. I mentioned last week, some people actually find that idea offensive. But by understanding that our salvation is a gift, it helps us understand what Paul meant when he said this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, continue to work 
out your salvation with fear and trembling. Does work out your salvation mean the same as work for your salvation? Not at all. Paul clearly states he's talking about your salvation, something you already have. If I say you need to wash your car and you don't wash it, it's still your car, just dirty. That's why the verse says, the next verse says this, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. He gave you a new life. Now he will give you a purpose and work you can do to advance his kingdom, which is your new home. How should we respond to his plan for us? He's God. He's our creator. How else should we respond but with awe, with reverence, and with gratitude? If, if Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg walked in here and said they were making a movie, and would we like to be a part of it, we'd think that's amazing. But they're just two men making a Hollywood movie. God wants us to be a part of something much grander. Much, much grander. Our only fear should be the fear of missing opportunities to bring praise and glory to God. So I'm skipping over so many beautiful passages, most you would recognize, but I want to stay on task. I want to point out those practical things we can understand and apply to our lives, knowing now we all can do better. Chapter 3 contains some strong warnings, particularly the warning not to do what the Galatian church did, which was to follow false teachers into a false gospel. He opens with this colorful language, Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. What makes this warning so sad, but so, also so urgent, is because he's talking about people who are calling themselves Christians. And these deceivers don't even know that they are deceivers and don't realize that they're the ones who have been deceived. These were Jewish people who just couldn't make the leap from the law to grace and who couldn't stand seeing others not follow all the laws. Jesus had the same problem with the Pharisees. Paul spoke against these legalists, uh, sometimes called Judaizers, this way. And remember, Paul had been a Pharisee whose whole life was the law. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul recognized that this wasn't easy. Um, he, he knew that he himself could do better. This is how he evaluated himself. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. Fight the good fight. Run the race to the finish. Wait on the Lord and he will renew your strength. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not faint. Don't look back on your mistakes. Press on. Make your finish better than your start. Chapter 3 has one more warning and then concludes with the glorious hope we all have waiting for us when we finish our race. As I have told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. Those 
verses don't need any commentary from me. But is anybody else looking forward to a glorious new body? This reminds me of a saying I've heard and I take great exception to. Have you heard this one? He is so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. I don't think that's possible. Show me a person whose mind is on heaven and I'll show you a person who makes earth a better place. So, now we can see all those things we can do and those things we can do better in our journey of sanctification. Important things like loving one another, being friendly, not arguing and complaining, but encouraging and agreeing, trusting God for all our needs and persevering in our faith. The final chapter adds a few more things that we can do to build up ourselves, build up our church, and build up the kingdom of God. And so I'm in chapter 4, starting with verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The God who created you, the God who died so you can have eternal life, the God who is preparing a place for you, what can you do for him in return? Rejoice. Be happy. Verse 5 says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. If God can show us so much mercy and so much grace, can't we try and do the same for one another? Next, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. God is in charge. Are you worried he's going to mess it up? We are his children. He will provide for us. He will protect us. Do you need something? Ask. Your father is very generous. Then verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. How are we to spend our time? Thinking good thoughts. Psychology 101 teaches the same thing. Get rid of your stinking thinking. Just know that Satan is working against us. He wants us to spend our time watching TV or being on social media or getting angry at someone who cuts us off in traffic. Or worst of all, he wants us to be thinking about our mistakes and our failures. If you need help finding things that are pure and praiseworthy and excellent, read the Bible or just try counting your blessings. One thing we can do to help ourselves is to look to other Christians who can serve as an example. There are plenty of them in this room. Paul knew he wasn't perfect, but he knew he was headed in the right direction, so he gave him this advice. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And what can we expect by putting these things into practice? Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We get so caught up in guarding our bodies, but it's our hearts and our minds that need guarding. Just imagine trading in all those negative thoughts and all those bad feelings for peace. The com complete peace, the peace that only God can give and that he wants to give to you. I was in the dentist this week, and I told the hygienist, Jennifer Burrow, some of you may know her. Um, anyway, I, I told her I was preaching this Sunday. She asked me if I had a personal story to tell. I said, no. She asked if I had a good joke. No. Nope. She said, oh, well, I'm sure you'll do fine. <laughs> I, I love Bob's stories. 
and some of his jokes. And I know that they make a sermon more interesting. But I truly felt led to tell this story, the story of what God has done for us, that old-time gospel message. And what, this, what we also can learn is what the Bible has to say about our journey with God, how we can grow, both in our knowledge of Christ and also in our service to his kingdom. Remember what Jesus said about seeking and finding, sowing and reaping, that we love God because he first loved us. We can never hide from God. We can never outgive God. We can never make, God let him, make him love us less than we are. After all, it was Jesus who said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And God bless all of you.